Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to today's webinar brought to you by the Global ESCO Network on the International Energy Efficiency Finance Protocol developed by EVO, the Efficiency Evaluation Organization. My name is Søren Nutkan. I'm the chairman of the Global ESCO Network. I'm also the uh, finance advisor for UNEP Copenhagen Climate Center, where the Global ESCO Network is hosted together with uh, EVO. The Global ESCO Network is a network of networks. It's a network consisting of ESCO associations around the world. We have 35 partners, which is about 90% of the ESCO associations that we have been able to identify. Those are in the countries that are out here with green. The blue are those that are not part of the global ESCO network yet. And the gray areas are there where we haven't found ESCO associations yet. We also help uh, establishing those ESCO associations when we can. Um, so we consider it 39 partners, potential partners, and counting. The Global ESCO Network is guided by an advisory board of six. The advisory board is currently working on a set of uh, pieces of policy advice that covers different areas of the functionality of ESCOs, one of which is also the financing of ESCOs. And that's today's um, focus of, of the webinar. We're not looking into the policy advice per se. We will come back to that once the policy advice is ready. But we're looking into the financing aspects of ESCOs. As we are hosted by the UNEP Copenhagen Climate Center, the global ESCO network is born with a climate change focus. And energy efficiency has, in fact, always delivered some of the best returns on investment in emissions reduction. That doesn't mean, though, that they have been easy to finance. In fact, energy efficiency is probably the hardest emissions reduction activity to finance, and the financing of energy service companies may be even harder. There are reasons for that, and not all of them are good, but one of the main ones is that the business does not conform to banks' traditional project evaluation criteria. And another is that Regulators rarely understand the business. Now, what, is, what have regulators to, to do with it? Well, regulators oftentimes enter into the sector in order to promote energy efficiency. Uh, but when they do so, they disregard the ESCO. They consider the ESCO as a private sector activity uh, that does not need any government support. But those that do not have uh, energy efficiency focus need an incentive uh, to, to bring about investments in energy efficiency. So in fact, governments put up competition to the private sector by providing uh, grant schemes that uh, exclude the ESCO from, from access. What they also do is that they take a single technology approach. So it may be that it's a grant scheme for efficient uh, air conditioners or for uh, heat pumps, which have been very popular over the past winter here in Europe. Uh, but mainly the, the misunderstanding that behind these uh, grant schemes is that they believe that investment in energy efficiency, in fact, needs grant funding. And it doesn't because it delivers quite good returns on investment. So, in fact, what they do is they're supercoating the cherry and they leave the pie untouched. Today's presentation on the International Energy Efficiency Finance Protocol takes a market-based approach. Energy efficiency and ESCOs, in fact, do not need grant funding. But they do need the banking sector to be an active partner that understands the business. And that is what the IEEFP is developed to achieve. I would like to hand over the microphone to Dindi Tanki from EVO for the presentation of the uh, the protocol, and look forward to the questions and answers after the session. You have a chat. You can submit your questions while Denny is speaking. 
So over to you, Jim. So thanks, Aaron, for the uh, the introduction and the opportunity to uh, present um, a broad discussion on the International Energy Efficiency Financing Protocol, uh, one of EVO's protocol uh, that has been uh, in, in, in on the shelves for many, many years now that we resurrected a few years ago. Uh, just a few words on, on EVO for those on the call who don't know us. Um, EVO is the home of the uh, IPMVP, the International Performance Measurement and Verification Protocol. Um, we were created 22 years ago as a non-for-profit corporation to continue, maintain, and uh, disseminate the, uh, the the good news about uh, measurement and verification and the IPMVP. Uh, we're led by volunteers from around the world. Uh, presently, over 100 people are involved in our various committees. And essentially, our mission is to uh, make sure that uh, people have confidence in energy efficiency as a reliable and sustainable energy resource and ensure that the savings are uh, measured um, and verified uh, in a proper manner. At the bottom of the screen, you can see our partners, uh, training partners mostly around the world. Uh, we will have a few more uh, logos to add uh, later this week, at least one, uh, which is an ESCO association. I won't say more for now. And there's going to be another major announcement in May as well uh, for another partners. Um, a short history of the IPMVP, um, it was created in 1996 as a North American Energy Measurement and Verification Protocol. And the year after it became international because uh, a lot of people uh, around the world showed interest. And then it was updated eight times uh, since then. Uh, and the last time was in uh, last year in March 2022. Uh, and it is now uh, known as the um, IPMVP core concepts. Um, it was recently published in Italian and Spanish for Mexico in March of this year. Um, we will release a Brazilian version in May uh, and French probably later this year. And along with the, I, uh, with the IPMVP, uh, we have a a series of application guides on different topics. Uh, one of them is on MNV and performance contracting. Uh, essentially, it's uh, it's onlining some of the issues that different stakeholders should be looking at when they are uh, engaged into a, a, an EPC contract. Uh, and we have other documents that will be released this year as well, uh, an application guide on advanced MNV. Uh, evaluation, measurement, and verification, which is essentially focusing on program evaluation and how the IPMVP can help. Um, uh, an, an uncertainty assessment guide for those who are really focused on statistics and the need to apply them in, in, in their projects. And we have three others, uh, three other guidelines. Uh, one of them is coming up next year or within a year at least. Uh, MNV for water, uh, MNV for renewables, and MNV for for option these uh, for those who know the the four option of the IPMVP. These are approximate uh, publication dates. Uh, I have no control over that. It's all in the hands of our uh, hundreds of volunteers. But it's um, it's it's uh, it's that's what's working right now uh, at Evo. We have two other protocols. Uh, one of them, which is not really well known, is the third party equipment certification protocol and the IEEFP, which uh, will be the focus of the presentation today. Just a few words on the uh, third party uh, certification protocol. Uh, this is more a, well, I mean, this, the document presents the rationale for conducting and using third party equipment performance certification. And it presents some evaluation methods um, and, and best practical uh, practices uh, for specific equipment uh, categories. Uh, the goal of this document is a, like all our document, is a risk reduction tool. Uh, it gives an understanding of how uh, of products performance expectations, and it's it, it, it gets into the picture when you consider financing uh, energy efficiency projects. 
if you're interested in seeing how the technologies that you're going to finance were approved or tested, uh, this document could be of uh, great help in, in that context. So that's why I'm raising it today, uh, because I think it's really uh, closely related to uh, the financing of, of projects. Uh, and of course, the IEFP, um, the, the IEFP is, is really a blueprint uh, to help loan risk and credit officers to understand uh, the basics of energy efficiency and really understand how attractive energy efficiency projects loans can be to facility owners, ESCO, and other potential developers and implementers of uh, energy efficiency projects. It's, uh, it is complemented by specific country annexes uh, covering local regulation, and this is very important because we if we talk about concepts that do not apply due to regulation purposes in some countries, well, it's uh, it, it's of no use. So right now we have uh, country annexes available for Canada and Mexico, uh, and we're working on a few others, uh, including Italy and Tunisia. And uh, we're quite willing to develop as many country annexes that will be needed. Uh, these annexes are not really complex sometimes, there could be only two or three pages or more, but really focusing on the uh, the local uh, situation. And we have a hands-on training on uh, on how to apply the uh, the various tools, uh, project-based templates and material provided in the program that I will uh, explain a little bit later as well. So the big question is, why bother about energy efficiency? Uh, I think there are tons of reasons. Why bothering about energy efficiency? But the, I, I guess the, the the most obvious one is climate change and all the declination that we can imagine about climate change. Uh, I mean, I've been in this business for close to 35 years now, and I've seen different terminology, but it all comes up to the same thing: is uh, we consume energy, we emit uh, greenhouse gases emissions. Uh, we are affecting the climate and uh, we need to reduce our energy consumption. So if people don't understand that, I guess we have a big gap to, to fill. But this is the, uh, I guess, the, the background for uh, the development of the IEFP in 2009. Um, more, more recently, of course, we have the Paris Agreement, uh, 2015. Um, that is calling for uh, to limit the uh, temperature increase to 1.5 Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Uh, goals that were reiterated in Glasgow in 2021 at COP26, uh, with some warnings though that uh, to achieve the 1.5, we're going to need to do more than what we're doing right now. Uh, I won't get into the details to that. Uh, but we all understand that there is a, a lot of driving forces behind the interest of financing energy efficiency projects. Um, just to give you an idea, this is uh, from the Climate Policy Initiative. Uh, in 2019-20, we're talking about $633 billion invested in climate finance by uh, public and private uh, institutions um, spread almost evenly between public and private at 322 and 311 billion dollars uh, these are no this is a lot of money uh, and just to give you another perspective of, of that if you put this slide in perspective and uh, shrink it down to um, the little red circle at the uh, at the bottom left corner of this slide uh, you see that to achieve the 1.5 Celsius pathway, uh, we're going to need to multiply this amount by 10 by 2040 annually. So we're talking about $6,000 billion annually to address climate change issues. So if banks do not understand that there's money to be made in energy efficiency, uh, I think this speaks for itself. Uh, if you look at carbon emission abatement and the role of energy efficiency, you can see that we're right at the same level as renewable. The one thing I don't like with this slide is the fact that if you look, consider energy efficiency as reducing energy demand, we're kind of 
contributing as well to the upper 25%, which is renewable, by reducing the need for more renewables. So the impact of energy conservation and efficiency is probably more than 25% that is showed here. Uh, and the same is true partly for electric electrification in the uh, in a new sector. So by being more efficient, we impact both the uh, reduced uh, reliance on energy production and by default the uh, renewables and also electrification. So uh, another good reason to do energy efficiency. Uh, why now? Uh, well, uh, tightening up global energy supply. Uh, I think 2022 was a reality check, particularly in Europe, uh, where we could see the impact of uh, security of supply that involved price volatility and supply chain disruptions, et cetera. Uh, and it triggered deep concerns about short-term energy savings, but also longer-term efficiency measures and, and projects. Um, more and more decarbonization is driving the renewed interest for energy efficiency. Um, there is a regulatory response with strict obligations to reduce consumption in many places. Uh, in France, for example, you have the Décret Tertiaire, which uh, gives very strict target for uh, energy consumption reduction by 2030. And you will see increasingly see that in many, many other countries. Um, financial institutions as well are joining the effort uh, with uh, different initiatives. I'm just mentioning one here, which is the uh, the PCAF initiative, the Partnership for Carbon Accounting for uh, Financials, um, which is the uh, development of GHG accounting methodology for financed emission. Uh, this is a top-down approach. The IEFP is providing a bottom-up uh, bottom approach, uh, and hopefully the different methods will meet somewhere in the middle. Um, and of course, with all this renewed interest for energy efficiency, there's also a renewed interest for measured and demonstrated savings. Um, more and more project founders require hard evidence that savings are real, and uh, everyone is also looking for risk reductions methodologies. Uh, one uh, example of uh, Guidelines for banks. Uh, this one is uh, from UNEP, April 2021. Uh, guidelines for uh, climate targets setting for uh, for banks uh, with four uh, goals. Uh, one is banks shall set uh, long-term and intermediate targets to support how they meet the uh, temporary goals of the Paris Agreement. Uh, two, that they shall establish emission baseline, uh, which is uh, and measure them annually which is in the MNV um, ballpark. Uh, three, that they should uh, use widely accepted science-based decarbonization scenarios. And four, that they should regularly review targets and ensure consistency with current climate science, which is again um, in the uh, area of MNV. For those who are interested in a, in a more um, structured presentation on financial institutions, and climate change and the need for MNV, I invite you to go on our website. Uh, at the top of the website in the menu, uh, look for the MNV Week 2023. And in, in there, you will find a webinar uh, from last year uh, by Livia mitke more uh, from BASE, uh, which uh, focuses on decarbonization uh, through energy efficiency and uh, achieving net zero targets. And you have the presentation material and the recording, and it's free. So I invite you to really listen to this uh, very interesting webinar. Um, Long-standing global energy efficiency barriers. Um, I could have made like 20 slides, I guess, uh, on, on, on this topic. Um, those who have been in this business for a long time uh, know that, they, well, there, there are, I would say three different categories of, uh, of barriers. Uh, some of them are economical, uh, of, like lack of financing options, uh, hidden costs, and perceived higher, higher risk, and things like that. Others are behavioral, uh, basically based on the, an organization um, 
continuing to behave the way that they have always done. Uh, and other are organizational, like some organizations are not considering energy efficiency uh, at all. Uh, so what you see in, in, in blue and on the left side of the, like the 12 uh, uh, barriers that could be, as I said, 24, 36, and 48, uh, these are organized and they could be categorized in economical, behavioral, and organizational. On the right side, um, I, I put them aside and they, they belong to the other three categories, but they are also focused on information and uh, import, imperfect information, asymmetric information, uh, the lack of capacity to interpret the information that is available to stakeholders, and the lack of trust in information sources. The reason why I put them aside on, on, on this slide is the the IEFP is really uh, addressing this part of the efficiency barriers, uh, which is focusing on information. Um, just, just to expand on, on two uh, typical barriers, like the apathy of, well, first of all, in, in many, in many situations, people are saying, well, projects are too small, complex, or boring, uh, not interesting, so we're not interested in getting involved. Very often, it's based on the apathy of facility owners, uh, and there are some reasons for that, as I'm, I listed on, on the right. Rather than read what's there, I, I'll, I'll give you a uh, just an anecdote of, of a situation. Twenty years ago, I did a, um, a study in Quebec for the creation of a uh, energy of an energy efficiency investment fund, and I consulted. Uh, tens of uh, CFOs and CEOs of uh, public institutions like schools, hospitals, universities, colleges, but also private sector um, facility owner. And just one example on the reaction I had, uh, this one is from a hospital. The, the person told me, well, I have a $225 million annual budget. My energy cost is $4 million, uh, which is a mere 1.8% of my budget, which is minuscule compared to my headache. And you're trying to sell me energy efficiency projects and saving 25% of this 1.8%. So you want me to spend time on 0.45% impact on my budget budget. And the conclusion was, well, why should I care? Which I thought, well, Yes, you should care, but if you don't understand it, I mean, it's your own right. But he concluded saying, I have more important things to do and to worry about. And and the conclusion was, anyway, and this is quite interesting in the context of regulatory barriers, he says, if I reduce my operation budget by $2 million, the the government will cut it next year by $2 million. So what's my incentive in getting involved in energy efficiency projects? That was 20 years ago. Maybe the climate change agenda was not so important as it is today. And I hope that today we have evolved to a point where a public sector manager would not react the way he reacted 20 years ago. And he would say, well, it's 0.5% of my budget, but regardless, it's important for the environment and I need to do something. So hopefully we're getting there. Um, from the, the bank perspective, um, on this slide, what you have on the left, uh, no attractive energy efficiency financing. And this one reflects the, the disconnect that banks uh, have with the financing of energy efficiency projects. Soren alluded to that in his introductory comments. And essentially, uh, generally speaking, banks will provide uh, lending uh, if the uh, the facility owner or the uh, the client invests 30% of its own capital in a project, so they will limit their lending to 70% of uh, an energy efficiency project capital cost, um, and they will also request a 100% collateral guarantee. And we all know in the in energy efficiency sector that the only collateral we have in energy efficiency is the savings. And since the savings is the absence of something, because we're not consuming energy, the collateral that we provide is basically like hot hair for a, uh, a banker. 
Um, so essentially, banks do not have confidence in savings of energy projects, uh, and uh, they are not interested in increasing their credit capacity to facilitate the owner. Uh, they limit. Uh, they have limited interest in energy efficiency projects because most of the time they are they are they are small transactions, complex, and they are not able to evaluate the risk and the benefits. And typically, they will offer short-term loans for existing line of credit. So they have no incentive to change the way that they are doing uh, business. So they, this is the unfortunate situation uh, that uh, historically we've, we've faced. Uh, there are challenges also that cannot be addressed at the level of the bank. Um, and essentially, those challenges and mostly the regulations and regulatory challenges and in the case of ESCOs, uh, for example, uh, if you cannot legally do uh, off-balance sheet projects, this is a barrier, a serious barrier that the banks cannot address. So essentially, there are going to be uh, situations where uh, the, uh, the, the financing will not be possible, and this will define the boundaries. Around, around which energy efficiency projects can or cannot be uh, be financed. But there are a lot of challenges that can be addressed, and they are related mostly to the uh, the right side of the slides that I presented on barriers, which is basically based on information. Uh, banks can address the, uh, the challenge of limited energy efficiency knowledge. Uh, they need to get educated. And this is what the IEFP is about as well. Uh, projects are not appealing, small and complex. Again, this is learned, something that they can learn. Uh, projects are not business as usual. Of course, they are not business as usual. I mean, we're creating, we're trying to get them into a new market that represents thousands of billions of dollars. If I was a bank, I would be interested in, in that free money that I can access, uh, essentially. Uh, insufficient collateral, same thing. Uh, they, this is this can be addressed if they understand the nature of energy efficiency. No confidence confidence in future cash flow, same issue. Uh, if we explain and explain and explain again uh, how positive cash flow can be generated from energy efficiency, that could change eventually the picture. This is addressed as well in the IEFP. And of course, the 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 um, the lack of uh, uh, appropriate investment grade audits and uh, uh, technical capacity in the industry or uh, could be also uh, a barrier, but this can be addressed as well by banks and other stakeholders in the uh, in the industry. So here comes the IEFP. Uh, again, it's a long introduction, but I think it, it's important to put the context into which this document was was developed and how it can be uh, put at use in in, in the uh, in, in the uh, energy efficiency sector. Uh, the main objective of the IEFP is to create an understanding for local financial institutions, and this is uh, I want to emphasize that this is really for loan and credit officers and banks. This is not a general public document, although it could be useful, but this is really um, oriented towards bank understanding energy efficiency. Um, it is designed to, um, to enhance the knowledge of those people on how energy efficiency projects can be relied upon uh, for loan repayment, essentially understanding the uh, positive cash flow, uh, how they can evaluate and mitigate the risk as well of energy efficiency projects. Uh, by getting knowledge of the technologies and uh, what they do and how they can generate again this uh, the, the, through the performance of those equipments they can generate positive cash flow. Um, we teach them or we give guidelines on how to structure project-based loan that minimizes the risks uh, and provide attractive uh, internal rate of returns. And most importantly, from evil perspective, is how to how the measurement and verification of energy savings can help them uh, mitigate the risk uh, as well of uh, potential uh, loans. Very quickly on the content, I am skipping chapter one and two, which are introductory, but uh, you will see here the uh, in the next slides the structure of the document. 
Uh, I won't get into the details because it's, uh, I, don't, I don't want to read the slides, uh, but just to give you the general idea of the context, uh, we start the document by providing uh, examples of key energy efficiency technologies that bank officers could be uh, uh, faced with uh, loan applications. Um, we have nine in the protocol itself. Uh, there are more, of course, but these are the most common ones. And for each technology, we present the key aspect of uh, the technology, so what it is, what it does, uh, and uh, we give an idea of the useful life of the the technology, so they have an idea of the uh, uh, the time that the payback could be uh, uh, applied to. We give an idea of the simple payback for each technology, uh, MNV factor, which is uh, how difficult it is or not to do measurement and verification and an assessment of the uh, savings risk. So each technology has a table like that uh, in the protocol itself. In chapter four, we focus on energy efficiency project development and finance process, uh, which is essentially showing credit officers how the, the, the project is being built internally uh, in, in a facility before they arrive at a bank with a loan application. So we're talking about the baseline assessment, uh, then the uh, the decision to uh, to do an IGA decision on what they want, uh, what the facility owner wants to install in the uh, in the facility, uh, and so on. Uh, so it gives an idea of the work that was done before arriving at the bank or at the financial <clears throat> institution to uh, to apply for for a loan. Um, we give an idea of what an investment grade audit looks like, what it contains, what it's uh, what uh, what it is used for by uh, the stakeholders in the projects. Uh, so banks can refer to that and understand what uh, what were the hypotheses behind the um, the project cost and so on. Um, of course, measurement and verification is a key part of the project. So we briefly present, like it's a two or three pages summary of the I IPMVP. Uh, essentially, we explain the four options. Uh, we explained that in absence of being able to to really uh, see the savings, that uh, the MNV is is acting as the meter of energy efficiency projects, uh, and we uh, emphasize the importance of an MNV plan as well. Uh, key stakeholders, uh, we explain the role of each stakeholders in a project. Uh, from end users, project developers, funders, not-for-profit, uh, product and services provider, energy suppliers. So we give examples of uh, different types of stakeholders and uh, what their role is uh, in a project. Uh, so if, uh, for example, uh, not-for-profit organizations are involved in uh, helping for GHG accounting, well, so the bank can see, okay, this is why they are involved in the projects and they have a role and they, they, they play a risk mitigation role as well and so on. So these kinds of example. Um, chapter eight, uh, focusing on different financing options, uh, essentially reviewing uh, various options like host equity, loans, leases, uh, infrastructure as a service, and energy services contract, and the role of ESCOs uh, that, uh, in projects. Um, chapter Followed by chapter nine, energy efficiency project contracts, uh, different types of contracts, like consulting fee-based, financing agreements, uh, construct construction and maintenance, uh, ESCO contracts again, and so on, again, to give a uh, an idea of the, poten the potential uh, contracts that could be involved in a con in a con in a project. Sorry. Uh, and then energy efficiency financing market needs. We explain what the market needs in terms of uh, loan products and credit products for energy efficiency projects. So. 
again, it complements the picture of uh, of, uh, uh, of energy efficiency financing for from the bank perspective. Uh, and we also give two examples of um, of uh, projects uh, that are <clears throat> with uh, with two different uh, levels of debt financing. One at seventy percent, which is the traditional um, bank uh, th- uh, maximum loan, and one which is one hundred percent debt financing. And we illustrate how the uh, uh, the cash flow uh, operates in both uh, contexts. Chapter 11, uh, project financing risks and mitigation strategies, uh, focusing on different levels of uh, perform- performance risk <clears throat> and mitigation at the development stage, uh, implementation, operation, and also uh, some contractual risk as well, and how these can be mitigated. Um, and then we have an extended discussion on the, the ESCO models. Uh, again, to introduce, we keep introducing the ESCO uh, in the document at various stages, so the banks uh, understand this this model. Uh, and then we offer a brief presentation on uh, examples of guarantee mechanisms uh, for financial institution. One of them, partial credit guarantee and uh, energy saving insurance uh, ESI uh, schemes. Uh, we have historical examples, but um, be, maybe on the ESI, the, this is uh, like let's say resurrecting, but there is a lot of renewed interest in ESI uh, for energy efficiency projects in South America. I know that um, in Europe, there was a project financed by uh, NH2020, uh, um, so not subsidy, yeah, subsidy. So there's renewed interest in, on that front, which is great. And we end this the protocol with uh, various checklists, one on risk mitigation, one on IG, and uh, one on uh, loan application guidelines. So that, that's the that's the in a nutshell what the IEFP is about. So as you could see, we we're, we're essentially introducing different concepts of interest on energy efficiency projects, always from the perspective of educating the bank and loan officers. The document itself takes about one hour to read. It's not, uh, it's not a Bible. It's not, uh, it's not meant to be a, uh, a reference manual, but it's meant to be a, a guide on uh, addressing loan applications and understanding what they are. Uh, so it's not, a training manual or a comprehensive document, as I said, but we do have a training program uh, that we uh, piloted in Canada in 2019 and 20, uh, and in Mexico in 2021, and uh, we're about to do another uh, training in Mexico in collaboration with GIZ and uh, through the NEMA facility. Um, and the, the 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 course is structured in three different components. We have pre-courses, self-taught um, courses. And one of them is the an introduction to financial terms used in energy efficiency. Um, and another one is uh, the introduction of energy efficiency technologies, uh, which goes a little bit further than what is being presented in the uh, in the IEFP itself. Uh, I think we have 13 or 14 different technologies in the course, uh, and, peop- and it, again, it's self-taught, maybe a couple of hours before attending the, the core course, which is uh, delivered through 12 training modules over two days. And at the end of day two, um, uh, actually it's two days and a half, at the end of day two, the participants are um, separated in groups and they have to prepare a loan application. Uh, and the following day, they present their loan application in front of a, uh, uh, not, not a jury, but like we're acting as the bank and they have to present the, their loan application and we're uh, asking questions. So it's really hands-on group exercise, role play. Uh, it can it complements the the two day training, and we have an advanced cash flow analysis course um, over two days, uh, including a certification exam that will essentially um, look at cash flow ex- analysis examples of 
the different technologies that are covered in the uh, intro to te technology uh, course. So this is the structure of the uh, the the IEFP. Now, why are we doing it? Well, I mean, I I'm personally I'm a believer in market transformation initiative. Um, we looked earlier at barriers. Um, and uh, very often barriers and market failure are put into not in contradiction to each other but we're talking about market barriers and market failure and i don't think there is a market failure in uh, in energy efficiency per se uh, but there is an effic efficiency gap which is obvious to anybody who worked in, who works in this industry and the gap is essentially the difference between what is economically feasible in terms of energy efficiency projects and what is actually actually uh, done uh, or invested. Uh, and this efficiency gap, in my view, is almost entirely the result of the result of information gap. Um, and this information gap must be addressed by education. And this is what the IEFP does for bankers. I think it complements a key part of the uh, this uh, this sector, and we complement that with other MNV activities that we have at Evo. Um, so that's what I call the market transformation uh, pyramid for energy efficiency MNV or even almost even projects. Uh, and from our perspective, it starts with I mean, the awareness webinars like the one we have this morning, uh, one we did in Mexico last week. Uh, essentially, any stakeholders interested in energy efficiency can just sit for an hour and listen to what is MNV, what is uh, uh, energy efficiency financing, how it works, and so on. Uh, and then we get to another level, uh, which is uh, a more formal introduction to either MNV or to uh, financing concepts through specific IEFP workshops that usually run for half a day or one full day. And then we get into the certification education. Uh, in our case, uh, the Performance Measurement Verification Analyst Program and the IEFP uh, that uh, that we're uh, that we developed, uh, we have performance measurement and verification experts, and then advanced and thematics uh, training on different teams like uh, statistics, ISO and IPMVP, uh, and so on. And at the very top, we have the hyper specialist or what we call the mentors. What's interesting in this picture is what you have on the right. Uh, I mean. Basically, at the uh, lower level of the pyramid, you have a lot of individuals, and as you get uh, higher in the pyramid, uh, you have uh, less and less people, but their level of knowledge uh, is increasingly higher as you get into the the, the pyramid. And I think the, the IEFP was really a missing piece uh, in terms of uh, this whole education structure in the uh, energy efficiency market transformation process and this is what the the protocol is is, is doing and, and the training program so hopefully uh, it's going to be of interest to many of you uh, now in concluding remarks uh, there are many reasons why financial institutions need to know the protocol uh, i think the most obvious one is what i discussed at the beginning is I think the sustainable finance <clears throat> will be will be there. It will not disappear. Uh, and with billions of dollars requested required to uh, to do energy efficiency projects, banks must be in, involved and they must show what they must understand what's what's going on. Um, the energy efficiency is one of the primary uh, mitigation for decarbonation. No doubt about that. So one good reason for banks. To to care, um, but they need to understand the technical details. Uh, need to understand the uh, the technical language of energy efficiency. And again, this is exactly what the IEF, the IEFP is doing. It's taking a banker and a, in, in two days giving them enough knowledge to understand what this business is all about, and so on. So there are many many reasons. I I put ten on this slides. I could have put 15, um, uh, uh, 
and I guess the last one is from from Evo is uh, uh, is important that MNV uh, will force technology providers to become more professional, and uh, which is uh, very very important for for the uh, the performance of projects. Um, for those interested in participating in the effort of the IEFP, we have a technical committee uh, that is led uh, by Lydia uh, Mitke Moret from BASE. Uh, she accepted the uh, chair position this week uh, or late last week. Um, we have a, a number of uh, people in that committee, but uh, we would really like to expand uh, participation through many 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 countries and regions across the world so we can beef up this program and discuss how we can disseminate uh, its content so that's it i guess on my part so if there are any questions i'm going to be very happy to address them many thanks Tini. that was extremely interesting also deeming from the questions that we have received in the chat the chat is still open so please continue submitting your questions Let's, let's jump to the questions um, first. A question here, if, if can, can the IEFP standardized concepts be extended to adoption of energy efficiency measures in the maritime industry? Sure, I mean, it's, uh, again, it's, uh, I mean, it's a it's guideline for financing projects for people who will provide the funds. So wherever the funds are going to be affected, the people who will approve the loans or provide the loans, uh, they must understand what energy efficiency is about, and that's what we're doing. Uh, but again, it's not an extended document on specific uh, situations, but it gives direction as to, okay, you're interested in fi financing this type of project and this type of industry, Here's the basis, and it gives you an idea. Okay, go there to get more information. So it's really a guiding document, not not a Bible itself, but it it could be used uh, in any sector, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, thanks. Here's another question, um, which says it was clear that the need for need of local financial institutions drove the development of the II. IEFP application and training program. Can you confirm that the IEFP concepts are intended not only to arm the bank credit and loan officers, but also other non-bank funders such as equity investments or super escrows? Yes, that's a good question, and the the answer is yes, obviously. Uh, interestingly enough, when we did the pilot projects in Canada and in Mexico. Uh, the participants to the uh, the training, we had about 25 participants in each case, and we had ESCO, we had government officials, we had utilities, we had banks, uh, we had funds, uh, private funds, uh, and clients as well as part of the uh, the crowd. And it became very interesting when we got into the role play situation at the end of day two and when they were preparing the, the loan application, because these people who are not used to talk to each other were talking to each other around an energy efficiency projects. Um, and they were using the, uh, the different hints and things that they had learned in, in, in the previous two days in terms of risk mitigations and things like that. So, Definitely, uh, yeah, it, it applies to uh, uh, all project funders, uh, whether banks or even governments or utilities or anybody who wants to have an understanding of who does what in an energy efficiency projects and how does that work and how can I make money out of it, essentially. All right. I unfortunately don't have the benefit of seeing who is asking the question. So, so um whatever needs to follow up you those who ask may also address us by email uh, just to follow up the questions but the questions are interesting for for all participants now the question here is what role will the iefp play where fintech products um which are tailored to the needs of borrowers will drive the lending is there any example of efp being integrated into a fintech product uh, hmm. That's a good question. Uh, 
again, I mean, this is something that we can explore. Uh, and I apologize if I don't have the, like, a lot of specific answers to specific questions because this is fairly new for us. So when we resurrected the protocol, we just, our goal was to get involved in the financial discussion from an MNV perspective, but also from an energy efficiency perspective. Uh, and since we've done that two years ago, we're kind of going in all directions and we see that it spreads uh, in areas that we could not uh, clearly see beforehand. So, um, I mean, my first reaction to yes, it, it could uh, apply or or be interesting for fintech financing, but we need to look at details and maybe adapt the uh, the product, um, particularly on the learning side, like the the training. We we could have specific training on on specific products that we could develop. And to follow up on, on that training, a bit, would you have any plans to do any training in India, maybe? We would love to. Uh, the only thing we need to do a training in a specific country is the development of a, uh, a country annex. And uh, essentially, the country annex, as I said earlier, is um, presenting or addressing issues like um, uh, off balance sheet financing for ESCOs, for example, what are the local banking regulations that would limit uh, EE financing by banks uh, and so on. So as soon as we have this annex, because it's part of the training itself, so the, there is a core uh, training which is about 80% applicable around the world and the the balance 20 percent at the end of the training is really country specific and this is based on the the country annex so if we can develop a country annex we can develop we can deploy the training uh, in any country uh india and we're working on tunisia i give you that example uh, but uh, yes uh, if you have, if any, if the person who asked the question has clue as to uh, where we should go to develop the country annex, and very often we're talking about maybe banking associations that could be part of this initiative, uh, that would be great because they get involved in the projects from from day one, and uh, then they would they are the ones who benefit from from the uh, the training itself. So definitely, yeah. Good. And and there are, there are more questions here also regarding the specific training in Mexico. I, I think the the answer for those would be to contact you directly, Denis, on on, uh, on how possibly to get involved or be part of that training. So so please, you who are who are interested in that, um, address uh, Denis directly by by email. Um, sure. Another question here, which which is. Uh, and I think you already have have addressed that already, uh, Denny. And uh, there are countries that need this education more than others. Um, so, so how do we how do we make sure that those countries are addressed? Would that be a bottom up uh, approach? As as you would you would like to do this for those countries that are interested in having it developed, uh, but you are not developing it top down. Driven, oh yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's demand, demand driven. Yeah, it's demand driven. If, uh, as I said, it, ideally the uh, the demand is either driven by uh, an existing project, project like like the one in Mexico was driven by GIZ and through NEMA facility uh, for for small and medium enterprises. Um, in Canada, it was driven by well, Canada is an exception because it. It was fun. It was driven by Evo uh, because the government of Canada financed the update of the IEFP. Uh, but in Tunisia, our goal is to work with the uh, the banking association of Tunisia. So it, we can either develop it ourselves, but uh, ideally, it's demand driven by specific countries or stakeholders in a country uh, that could drive this uh, this project uh, along with us. Very well. We are at the top of the hour, or in fact, the half hour, but we are reaching the end of the, the webinar. There's only one last question that I would like to ask you, Denny. How well is this uh, IEFP being received by the financial institutions, and, and how do we get them to read it? 
the feedback we've got uh, in Mexico last year was uh, extremely good from financial institution. Um, and how do we get them to read it? It's it's available for free on our website. Uh, people just need to register uh, as um, uh, uh, with a free account, and then they can download the document. Uh, but in terms of dissemination, if uh, I mean, I am available to make presentations to in whatever context people may think of uh, in, in front of um, banks, bank associations, or any other groups. Um, and we can even distribute uh, the the document uh, directly to interested parties. So, again, it's free from our website. Uh, people can download it and distribute it and uh, make a good use of it. And, and contact right. contact us whenever in doubt. <laughs> so we'll be happy to assist. Excellent. And, and contact details are on our website, the Global Esco Network uh, website. Both Denis and, and, and I am there. Um, the recording of this webinar will also be available, if, if not tomorrow, then sometime next week. We normally edit them uh, a bit before public, uh, making them public. Um, so, so please check our website for this webinar and all the former webinars that we have been doing on different topics related to ESCOs. I apologize for those questions that we might not have been able to answer in, in this uh, hour. But I thank you, Denis, very much for your presentation and all of you out there for joining our webinar today. We look forward to seeing you at future webinars from the Global Network.